All right, here we are, uh, Book of Genesis, Foundation Book of the Bible. That's the name of the entire series. Tonight's lesson, I believe we're on lesson number eight. And we're going to look at day, uh, part of day three and four. Moving along. So let's do a little review, shall we? Just to get back in the swing of things. Day one, God brings into existence the time, space, matter, Elements, the basic elements, are created. They are then energized by the power of the Holy Spirit and they take on form and energy. God also sets into motion the uh, dark light cycle and that's the end of day one. Day two, we've talked about this, if you remember this particular uh, graphic here, God separates the earth-based water from the water canopy above. So you've got the water canopy above uh, the earth, you've got the atmosphere, then you have the earth and the water that is in the earth that is created on day two. Uh, and this system is the basis for the pre-sin environment which was without extreme temperature, without weather patterns that we have today. Uh, we talked about that at length uh, last week. Very interesting, uh, you know, very interesting the idea of what the environment and the weather was like before sin, very different than it is today. Then day three, we began uh, last time, God separates the water on earth from the land on earth. So we have the separation, the land appears. So we left off at this point during the third day of creation also uh, day, the day was one dark light cycle as we know it now. This is what the word day in Hebrew means. The word yom was used and the word yom refers to an ordinary day, not a, not a, a dispensation, not an era. Uh, it refers to a single 24 hour day. So let's continue day number three, shall we? and read uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 11 to 13. Uh, says, then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning a third day. So we see here there is a division of land and water, a division of light and dark, and now God begins to cover the earth with vegetation to complete the work of the third day. A Couple of interesting features of this particular act of creation. Um, Genesis mentions the three main orders of plant life. Now there may be different divisions given by modern science, but these three include the, all the vegetation that exists. So he says, first of all, there's vegetation or, or grass. Now there's ground spreading, uh, the type of vegetation that covers close to the ground. And then he mentions plants and herbs, includes bushes and shrubs and flowers and so on and so forth, second division. And then the third are trees and fruit trees, large woody plants, of course, including all the types of trees, all types of fruit bearing trees. So you know, we divide things up perhaps differently today, you know, species and subspecies and so on and so forth, but this is the main, the three main types of vegetation that we have and that is described in Genesis. Also, uh, Moses mentions seed and kind, referring to the ability of vegetation to reproduce itself and not some other type of thing. You know, modern research reinforces the idea that each organism has its own unique structure of DNA. And can, uh, and can only specify the reproduction of that same kind. You know, there's a great amount of variation within each kind, but there are no new kinds. Understand what I'm saying? There is a horizontal vari variation, 
color, style, health, form, but there are no vertical changes. In other words, plants cannot be breeded to produce animals. You understand what I'm saying? You see, there's no, there's no, none of this lower to higher thing. And animals, you can breed animals every which way, but you will never produce a plant or a tree. I know that sounds almost ridiculous, you know what I'm saying? But the evolutionary mindset says we all start from a common thing and then we kind of vertically go up. But the Bible says from the very beginning, you know, there is species and kind within kinds, but you can't generate one thing from a completely different kind. As I mentioned, evolution says that everything comes from a common ancestor, but this passage and observation demonstrates that each living thing has its own seed. Today we'd say each living thing has its own DNA. And so you know, we give things a more modern term and we look into them more deeply to see their complexity, but the, the essence of it doesn't change. Okay? Each produces after its own kind. There are no new kinds, there are only variations of the original kind. All right. Another idea here, the creation was done in a day, but what was created was fully mature. Now we know, those of, uh, you know, I think all of us have planted either flowers or trees or something like that. We know a tree, you know, it grows, it, grows, it takes a year, two years. You know. We can tell the difference between a tree that's maybe one year old and a tree that's 50 years old. You know? I mean, we can usually tell the difference between. But when the creation was made, it was fully matured. The trees and the plants, as well as all other created things, were made with their age built in. You know, if we could go back and let's say we could bring Dr. Carey with us back to the very beginning you know, and he would examine Adam and Eve, the very, first, you know, the very first question that he would ask them would be, who's your insurance carrier? No, I'm just kidding about that one. But the very, you know, if he were to examine you know, Adam and Eve, <laughs> he would, he would, he would, he would you know, say, well, this is a, Male and, and you know, a male, you know, somewhere around 20 years old, but not a, it's not a baby, it's not a little child, it's not a pubescent child. It's, this is a grown man here and this is a grown woman that would normally take you know, 15, 20 years to, to, to grow. God creates a, a fully mature uh, creation. And this explains the discrepancy in the ages that are sometimes observed by science. Something can take a certain number of years to develop to full maturity under the present terms that we have and the conditions that we have. But at the beginning, God called these things into existence fully matured. You know, various resources in the earth already locked in to the earth at creation. And the reason that God can do that is He's not stuck in time. We're stuck in time. For every living thing, there's a yesterday, a today, and tomorrow. There's, there's, we're, we're in time. God is not in time. He controls time. He can make something with time built in already. As a matter of fact, some people say, we cannot, we cannot even figure out how, the, you know, how things have been made simply because we live within time and the creator of all things lives outside of time. So it's impossible for a creature that lives within time to figure out how someone, some being outside of the time continuum works. Because it's like trying to pour a five gallon jug of water into a thimble. It'll hold some water, but you can't get all the water into it. Well, it's just like us. We can understand a part a section, something that's been revealed, we, we can understand that, but we just don't have the capacity to take in all of it, to be able to understand everything and how God has created everything. So with the creation of the vegetation um, and plant world, there's a close of the third day as we see, again, the context and the grammar used, a single dart-like cycle of what we know as 
24 hours. All right, so let's look at day number four, shall we? It says, then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning a fourth day. All right, I want you to notice, I want you to notice that on the first day, God said, let there be light. And then on the fourth day, He said, let there be lights, plural. So at first, there is intrinsic light, the electromagnetic spectrum. Then there are the givers, of light, or the light generators, the Hebrew word ma'or. So there's a logical order to this, and that's what I really want you to look. There's always a logical order to what, you know, to what God is doing here. Uh, and also, in answer to the individuals that say, oh, this is just a fable, and they're just myth stories, and you know, it's just a lot of gobbledygook. Well, it, you know, it's not a lot of gobbledygook. You know? There is order, there's process here. At first, God produces light energy, which sets the dark light cycle into motion. Then He creates the, me the mechanisms that will generate light in order to keep that cycle going. So some people say, and now I'm getting into an area, you know, some people say, well, how do you explain the problem of light rays taking millions of years to reach the earth? And the idea of a young earth, how do you kind of, you know, match those two. And the answer that, that, that you get uh, when you research that is that God created the light trail, then created the source. Remember the concept of a mature earth were things that evolutionists would say, well, would have to take millions of years because they're counting as individuals who live within time. You understand what I'm saying? Because they live within time, they have to count using millions of years. Someone who exists outside of time is not restricted by that and can make something instantly that looks to someone on the inside that it might take many, many, many years. So there are some problems in reconciling a young earth with movement and the explosion of stars. But the study of stars, contrary to what a lot of people say, that's not an exact science. You know, we need to fold what we know about them into the creation account and not the other way, not the other way around. Uh, believe it or not, there have been other unexplained things that seem to discount the accuracy of the Bible and the account of Genesis in particular, but in time, these things were explained. I use one example, for, uh, and that is the example of the Hittites. The Hittites were an ancient people. They're mentioned in several places, but I chose Genesis 23. It says, now Ephron was sitting among the sons of Heth, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the sons of Heth, even of all who went in at the gate of his city, saying, this passage is from the, the, uh, the place in uh, Genesis where Abraham is wanting to buy a burial place for his wife, Sarah. And uh, of course, he didn't own any land. God had promised him the land, of course, you know, that his descendants would possess that land, but he himself did not own any land. He was a stranger. He was a wanderer in that land uh, during his life. But when he wanted to bury his wife, he, needed a, he had nowhere to put her, so he uh, offered to purchase a cave, a burial place, that belonged to the, one of the local chiefs there. And it says here, uh, he talks about Ephron the Hittite. And there's a, long, there's a dialogue between him and this individual, very interesting about them bargaining 
for the land, you know, and then finally they come to a price and Abraham buys the land or buys the cave so he can bury his wife, Sarah. Now for the longest time, actually all the way up to 19, around 1900, um, those who opposed the Bible, those who did not believe in the Bible, used the idea of the Hittites, the mention of the Hittites here as one of their strongest arguments because they claimed archeologists and historians have never found any trace of this, not just person, but if this tribe of this people, the Hittites, they don't exist anywhere, they're just made up. And so you know, if there's a mistake in the Bible or if the Bible is just making up stuff, uh, how can it be dependable? Well, for hundreds of years, this, you know, people had to say, well, we don't understand everything. You know, we have to wait till other things come up. You know, just like I'm talking about the stars and so on and so forth. Well, in the 1900s, what do you think happened? Archaeologists found not just a, an artifact, the whole city where they lived and they unearthed it and they found uh, all kinds of artifacts with Hittite writings, the history of the Hittites, so on and so forth. Big news in the archeological world, having found an entire you know, civilization there that had been hidden for, for centuries. But for those of us who you know, believe in the inerrancy of the Bible, who believe in the inspiration of the Bible, it was a tremendous find because it confirmed you know, what the Bible had written, what was contained in the scriptures for all these many years, but could not be proven you know, from archeology. span And finally, it was proven uh, by archeology span that this people, these people existed and that the Bible was accurate about this. So I tell that story to say, hey, maybe not all the science questions have been answered, you know, but in time, many of them have been answered, and I'm sure that they all will be uh, with time. So getting away from the Hittites, back to what we we're talking about, the creation of the lights and so on and so forth. These lights were placed in the expanse of the heavens, meaning in this context, out in space. Not our atmosphere, the lights were out in space. I want you to note some interesting features of this particular part of the Creation. Remember, he says he created the light, now he's creating the lights and, and places them in the expanse, meaning you know, above the atmosphere. First of all, both the sun and the moon were light givers, uh, but not light generators. In other words, the sun generates light and the moon reflects it. The idea is that the earth is the object of God's attention and these two bodies directly serve God's primary purpose with the earth. They're not some sort of solar fluke. You know, some people say, well, it just so happens, you know, by happenstance through the evolutionary model that the earth is just exactly the right distance from the sun not to burn up or not to freeze. You know, it's just an accident. And they're always looking around for the same combination in the solar system you know, to see if if, if life could support, or, or if another planet could support uh, human life. Um, I believe that uh, this was put into Genesis, as I say, to uh, confirm the idea that these two bodies were put in specifically for God's purpose. The other thing too is there's no random thing that God does. If a star is in a, per a particular place in the sky, that's where He put it. You know, everything is under God's power. So the sun and the moon are light givers. Another thing, the Bible attaches much more importance to the sun and the moon than to the other stars mentioned, even though these others are bigger in size and more numerous. I mean, you know, there are millions and millions of stars and many of them much larger than the moon, uh, the moon, yeah, the moon, but, but I meant, I meant the, the, the sun, much larger than the sun. And, and, and it makes people think, well, I guess that's insignificant, we're insignificant, but no, not at all. The importance is not based on size, the importance is based on how they fit 
into God's plan. That's the significance of the moon uh, and the sun. They, they maintain the light dark cycle of life on the, uh, on the earth. And so the sun and the moon are greater than the stars, not in size, but in importance concerning God's purpose for mankind. And then another point maybe that we might want to look at, the stars were set in place as they are now. What we see now is what Adam saw when he looked up. Now there have been fluctuations and stars burning, shooting stars, which are features of the heavens that God created, but essentially what we have now is what God originally uh, put into place. Another point about this, the heavenly bodies serve various purposes. Okay? For example, we have uh, the day-night. They govern the day and the night. The cycle of dark and light are produced by the sun and the moon. The light each projects upon the earth. So there's a purpose for all of that. They're just not just random bodies floating around in the sky. They also are there to serve um, in glorifying God. In Psalm um, 19 verses one and two it says, the heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. Day to day pour forth, pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge. What a marvelous passage. You know, people, yeah, I've seen movies and things and where people lie back and they look up at the stars and they go, you ever wonder why the stars are there? You know, and oh, I don't know, I guess they're just so beautiful. You know, but if you look in the Bible, the Bible tells you, why did God create these, trillion, these millions of stars? Why did He do it? To honor Himself. To give human beings the opportunity to wonder at how great, if you're ever wondering how great is God, take a look up in the sky and you will see how marvelous God is. The vastness of the number and their size in comparison to us inspire us with awe and praise towards the God who made them. Man, what kind of God do we have that did this simply so that we, for now, this is what we know, simply that we could look up and just give Him praise because of the power of, of His creation. How marvelous is that? To study the stars and see them up close and only measure their size and what they're made of is really kind of missing the point. You ever realize that there are things that have been created that we will never see, that are magnificent in themselves and powerful, we'll never even see them. How many things have they you know, discovered beneath the ocean only because now they have submarines you know, and cameras that can go deep, deep, deep into the ocean and we find these incredible, this incredible life down there, you know, sea life and plants and whatever, you know, creatures that can live in the absolute darkness and coldness of the sea. And we look at them, there's a whole life there, not seen or even thought of for, for the history of man. For the first 10,000 or whatever years, you know, nobody has ever seen this. And yet God has created that and sustained that all of this time, why? for His glory, so that one day we would discover it and say, what, what God is this? How great this is. You know, when we sing the songs that our brothers lead here, uh, you know, how great thou art, do we realize why we say how great thou art? How could anyone look at all of this and not believe that there is a God in heaven just, just beyond me? Another way that they serve is they define the seasons. A little more down to earth. In Psalm 104, 19, it says, He made the moon for the seasons. The sun knows the place of its setting. So they serve in ways to define the seasons of the year. Now, I'm not sure if this refers to the period after the flood 
or the uh, gravitational role of the moon on the earth's atmosphere. I don't know what the, you know, the psalmist is referring her here to, but we do know the seasons, right? We do know the seasons. They also give signs. God has used the stars. We've been talking about the stars and the planets here. God uses these to give signs to men. The sun and the moon stood still as a sign that God fought for Israel against the Amorites. In Joshua chapter 10, verse 12 and 13, it says, Then Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the sons of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, O sun, stand still at Gibeon, and O moon in the valley of Aijalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation avenged themselves of their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jeshar? And the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and did not hasten to go down for about a whole, a whole day. And so God uses the stars as a witness to men that He is involved in the affairs of men. Why? Because they can see, you know, the sun doesn't move. The sun doesn't, doesn't move in the sky for an hour or for a day. Who could do that? Only God could do such a thing. Then of course, the most famous one, a star was used to identify the birth and the birthplace of Jesus. Matthew 1, verse 1 and 2, some pretty familiar uh, passages here. It says, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. So God is using star this time to announce the birth of, uh, of Jesus Christ. This idea, of course, has been perverted by magicians and others who try to use the position of the stars to determine the future or the character of people. You know, what's your horoscope? Well, what is sad uh, in our society is that more people in our society know what their horoscope is, but they, they couldn't quote to you one single verse out of the Bible. That's the, that's the sad part. So uh, God is allowed to use His creation in different ways to reveal things about Himself, like using stars, if you wish. But man cannot find out things about the future by manipulating God or His creation. That's the essential definition of magic. The essential definition of magic is using something within the creation to try to figure out what's going on in the spiritual world or to try to figure out what's going to happen in the future. So studying the stars or reading palms or tea leaves or numbers or whatever. You know, in the ancient days they read the organs of animals, you know, livers and hearts and things like that. To use anything in the creation, any object, to use it in such a way as to figure out what God is doing, that's magic or to try to influence the spirits in the spirit world so that they'll work on your side. You know, what do you think uh, superstitious baseball and football and athletes do? You get, they got their lucky puck, their lucky stick, their lucky rabbit's foot. What is that? It's just a form of magic. It's just saying with this object, if I keep this object close to me, then the spirits will favor me. That's pretty much what magic is. But God calls this an abomination, why? Because we're depending on physical things to manipulate a spirit. Well, that's, no. God can use it, but we, we can't. Once again, God sees what He has made, getting back to Genesis here, and He sees no evil thing. Everything is good, everything is in order, everything is pleasing in His sight, everything has been made in a single light-dark cycle, 24 hours. So let's have a summary of the four days now, see what they look like before we close it out. First, there's the time, space, matter, light, dark cycle. That's what's made first. Then water on the earth, atmosphere around the earth, water above the atmosphere. 
the vapor canopy that protected the earth and maintained it like a, like a greenhouse, if you wish. Next, day three, water and land are separated and then vegetation is created. Makes sense, doesn't it? You wouldn't want to make the vegetation before the land and the water separated. Day four, the sun, the moon, and the stars in this order. The sun, the moon, and the stars. Why? Because the sun and the moon will have a much larger impact, will be used by God uh, in the uh, life, the daily life of, of men, and the stars less so. Uh, I think the stars are used more in a kind of a theological way by God to witness to Himself and so on and so forth. All right, next week we're going to move on to animals. We're going to talk about animals. We get through this creation part, move on to the story of Adam and Eve. All right, thanks for your attention. Very good.